what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X. Tony Horton talked about how he made money as a street mime uh, before selling hundreds of millions of dollars. And he would actually, you know, Chris put his hat on the street, do street miming to make food and rent money. Okay. Um, I don't like just hearing the successful stuff. I like hearing uh, the, t- the tough times too. Um, Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talked about growing her company to $20 million with five employees selling to Disney. But the most impressive was beating cancer twice. And um, Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about when he was, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. That and many more, you could go to inspiredinsider.com and check them out. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And you know, with Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. Um, and basically, we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. So, but Chris, you know, podcasting is much more personal for me. I don't know if I've even told you this, but, um, it's not just about the business, although it's been the best thing for my business and my life. Cause I've formed amazing friendships, referral partnerships, strategic partnerships, clients, but it was actually inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor and his brother and him were in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. They were only members of their family to survive. And his words and legacy live on because of an interview, because the Holocaust Foundation actually did an interview with him. And now I have put it on my about page. I could watch it every year. He's not alive anymore, but I could watch it. I do watch it multiple times a year and other people can too. And his legacy lives on. And so, yeah, podcasting will help your business, no doubt. Um, but it helps you and your guests leave a legacy of knowledge beyond. Um, and so, you know, so if you have questions, you know, go to rise25.com. If you have questions, you can email us support at rise25media.com. I believe if you have a business, you should have a podcast, period. Just like Chris believes if you have a business, you should be taking care of your SEO and rankings because that is the lifeblood of your business. So check it out. I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Chris Dreyer, who's the founder of rankings.io. And, you know, his company helps elite personal injury firms land serious injury and auto accident cases with Google search. If you want to learn something, what I've learned from studying Chris is focus. Okay. Just focus. And he focuses, he niches down. And by doing that, he can be really systemized and he can serve the client better. And um, they are a personal injury law firm SEO agency and serve clients all over the country. And they help them win first page rankings. And he started rankings.io because he saw the legal vertical was underserved. And he saw many of the competitors were not delivering the results they should. And he knew he could do better. And I love this saying, which is true, by the way. Um, they have to have first page results because if you're on the second page, you're dead. And actually, you know, Chris, I would disagree with that. Okay. The way I disagree with it, it's not even the second page. If you're on the lower half of the first page, sometimes yeah, you're true. dead. True. Right. Not even the second page. You know, people ask me, Jeremy, how'd you find out about me? I'm like, I went to the third page of Google, which no one goes to. Right. Mm-hmm. But check out rankings.io for more information. Um, they have an amazing company. Chris, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for the intro. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to dig in a little bit to a couple things. And, um, you know, with your background, you, what was your major in college? Because it has nothing to do with marketing. Yeah, and, that's funny. And how that you got funny. into this. So I actually have a history education degree. And what, what were you thinking you were going to do in college? I, I was going to coach sports. I was going to coach college sports. You were. So that was kind of. I was really into uh, basketball and just had a passion for it. And to be honest, when I, I student taught at a high school, they ended up hiring me and I, I was there. I rose from their freshman to sophomore mm. to, to JV coach really quickly. Um, so it's kind of next in line. This was basketball. Course. Yep. Okay. And basically how I got started was I 
was in the detention room, the room that they, they sent the kids that got into trouble. Uh, they had to stay an extra hour after school. And I, there was just nothing to do. Um, it was just kind of like, you know, just taking care of these kids. And I Googled how to make money online, <laughs> as cliche as that is. And I took Ed Dale's 30 day challenge to make your first 20 bucks. I think I made, you know, 10 bucks. And but it gave me the basis of knowledge to, to go from there. And, and by the end of my second year teaching, I was making more mm. affiliate marketing than I was teaching. So I pursued it full time. What were you selling? What were you an affiliate for? That's so fun. That's so funny. I rarely get asked that. So, so how to stain concrete floors. I still have an Amazon. I thought book. you were going to say like erectile dysfunction pills or something. <laughs> because that is sold- actually, you know, that's actually a popular, what people don't know, that's a very popular affiliate offer. But anyways, keep going. Yeah, stained concrete floors. So it's actually, there's an Amazon book still for sale. Um, I also did the ACA fruit. I did, let's see, um, I sold generators. I sold, uh, I had a site that ranked number one for double chin. So I sold uh, really? stuff to lose weight. Yeah, alcohol withdrawal. So um, I had a site that ranked number one for alcohol withdrawal, alcohol poisoning that was like more google adsense but so were you building the sites and getting the rent what was your methodology at the time so at the time if you had your you know your your white hat good guy you know your middle gray hat or your black hat tactics i was more on the black hat side so it was more buying if it's it's gonna get in trouble do not no 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 okay so i i kind of learned what not to do (laughs) so so, but back in the day, I was taking the shortcuts. I was buying links, buying content, and and I got penalized for that. Around 2011, my income went from, you know, 15k a month in affiliate down to 2k, just overnight. So, I learned the hard way. So I've really been walking the line ever since. Yeah. But at the time, was that really something that was you? you you said you should not be doing because a lot of people were doing that at the time, right? Right. And then right. Google just decided that's not quality content and slap people. But I don't know if it's necessarily black hat, like yeah, illegal. Yeah. I mean, people were doing it and it was totally legal to do. It's just, it was a short-term fix. You're, you're dead on. It wasn't an evergreen strategy. That's probably a better name for it. I was generating a uh, low quality content just to target a keyword. Mm -hmm. I was acquiring any backlink I could as opposed to really concentrating on quality. What was the site affiliate product you were most proud of that was like tough to rank, but you were, you know, churning away? Hmm. Ranking number one for double chin was pretty, pretty. That's amazing. Yeah. What was your URL? Did you buy like a specific URL for this product? What was it? And it's, it's down. You could probably see some horrible version of it on archive, uh, but it was losadoublechin.com. Hmm. That's a gr- you don't still own it? You should have kept on it. No, I, I actually, that. yeah, I let all of the, the focus thing that you mentioned earlier, I actually made a decent amount of money and I just let those kind of go away just so that I wouldn't spend any time on them because my other opportunities was, was much better. Uh, and that's, that's honestly, I, I probably could have that revenue still, but I just turned it all away and directed my yeah. attention Okay. Yeah, lose double chin. Oh, totally. You were hitting on a huge pain point there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you everything because I wrote a lot of the original content about the What was the chin. product? Was it a digital, it was like an information product? There were several. So there was, you know, there was diet and exercise type advice. Uh, there was stuff for chin wraps, like sculpting. There, uh, there was a lot of stuff. Yeah. So you cut your teeth on that. So how did you decide to transition to not just law firms, by the way, mm-hmm. personal injury law? It's a niche within a niche. I mean, you, you really, you know, focused. I, so when my income declined and I was at like two or $3,000 a month, I'm like, I knew that I had a, a specialty though. Really so quickly. I, Cause did, did you quit your job at the time? At what point did you decide to quit and do full time? Yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, I quit my second year of teaching and then I got paid that whole summer. So I had my affiliate income plus my teacher's uh, income. <laughs> I even took that, that that teacher's retirement money through a big party, got to know people uh, that I was getting mentored by. Retirement but, party. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, it was really funny. After but, two years, um, people hated you. Because of that. <laughs> It was a lot of fun, and I learned it's a, a lot. Scary, it's a scary thing to do, right? I mean, yeah. so at that point, you were still kind of on the up and up. It hadn't dropped at that point. Right. I was still on the major um, the upward trend. Mm-hmm. And I even had I had several freelancers. You know, I was really processizing my, my affiliate marketing strategies for scale. And you know, when that declined because I wasn't doing the evergreen tactics, I still had a really strong knowledge of digital marketing. So that's why I looked at the, uh, the agency space. And I worked for a law firm marketing agency. I, I rose to the top of their company. I was their top guy. Hmm. And I got really comfortable in the niche. Hmm. I, I had a great relationship with them personally. I didn't think that they were running the business correctly. So like what? I mean, we won't mention names, but what were the things that you knew when you had yours, you would do differently? They weren't managing money for production properly. So there just wasn't enough resources applied to the labor to generate the results. So they would they would sell <laughs> out of contract not allow enough resources to give the best chance to succeed. What else did you see? that they were doing that you knew you'd do differently? They weren't focused on reinvesting into operations and training. Mm -hmm. So just a lot of basic business principles, you know, operations, processes, training, you know, Mm -hmm. continuous improvement. They weren't focused on that. It was more of a sales organ, a sales focused organization, bringing in the revenue, not taking care of the existing clients. Um, And I just, so when I started rankings and still today, we have one sales guy, we have one marketing guy, everything else is applied to generating the best results we can for our clients and right. using those results as momentum for referrals. Mm-hmm. What do Chris people say, what do your clients say they like about you in the business? I one, um, watch one video and they, one person said, I love, they just call me back immediately, you know, within a few hours. Uh, what are some other things that you, you know, because that will kind of put a light on what you feel is important probably because it's showing up on what they like. Yeah. So you hit one of the first significant differences in our organization versus others is a lot of times uh, communication and production are all in under one function. I separated account management and operations. So it's clearly defined that these are your communicators. This is, these are the individuals that do production. And I didn't want the people that were talking to the individual, the clients to also do production because they have their head down, so to speak, only concentrating on doing the work and not necessarily up looking for opportunities in a strategic manner. Hmm. So, and that also allows us to better serve the client uh, with faster response times because that's that person's sole job is to keep the client informed and, and to lead them in the project. How do you manage client communication? Because I imagine clients communicate via email, phone, text, and now like other means. How do you, you know, I won't say train the client, but how do you want them to communicate with your with your team so you can do a better job and, and serve them. So it's funny in, internally we say, and I, I think our clients would laugh at this, but we, we have our teach our clients not to be crazy. And what we mean by that is just really setting expectations early. This is how long it's going to take to generate results. This is what we need. This is, this is how you can help us. And we set all of these expectations up front in a 100 day experience. Hmm. We got this from Joey Coleman, never lose a customer again. And in terms of our communication preferences, you know, a lot of it's still driven by email, but we also incorporate video, we incorporate text messaging, uh, in some cases, uh, Slack or Google chat. Mm -hmm. And then we do regular cadences for, uh, consults. So early on, we're trying to set expectations we will establish a regular meeting cadence so they know when they're going to talk to us. Mm -hmm. What about internally? What, what do you prefer? I know you mentioned Slack. Are there any others that you like to use? 
Yeah, so Slack is our main communication portal since we run a remote team. Uh, we also, also use Zoom for our video conferencing. And then our main task-based or project management tool we use is Trello. Uh, we really like the workflow Kanban style of, of uh, process, um, you know, completing tasks. And in terms of just communication in general, tying things into a larger picture, we, we are fully integrated into the entrepreneurial operating system and traction. Hmm. Nice. Um, yeah, I've had Gino Wickman on. So um, why, how did you come to personal, I mean, you could have been like, yeah, we're going to specialize in law firms, but you decided to niche down even more to personal injury law firms. So one of the main reasons is I like the challenge. So when, when you're dealing with, you know, trademark attorneys and these very low competitive types of niches, a lot of times all they need is a, a, a website and a landing page and they can practically rank. Personal injury is highly saturated. It's very rewarding if you can get those guys' results. And I, I really like the competitive aspect of it. And I saw that they really needed a specialist in that, that area of the law. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about some of the, I like how you, you have some tools you use to kind of audit someone to really see how much work is it gonna take to get them to where you need. Um, but first, you mentioned something, you like this. Most people will be the opposite, right? I wanna go into something that's you know, needed, but not as competitive. And you go right head on with the most competitive. And, and um, I, you, know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I wanna hear some of the lessons you learned from your dad, because uh, you quoted him saying, um, always play the game to win. Right. Yeah, so, that's it. It's it sounds kind of like Ricky Bobby, right? <laughs> um, but losing is not fun. Winning is. Yeah. Winning is rewarded. So when we encounter a challenge, we we go all in. Um, that's how I was brought up. Even simple games like Yahtzee, it's it's it gets almost annoying where we're doing the math and which properties to buy in Monopoly, the one properties and. Um, very math based, but that's how we've approached. That's how I approach sports. That's I was a, a collectible card game player, similar to Magic, one of the top players. Same in poker. Um, it's just just focus, and I like to. I think it's rewarding when you get to that those top levels. What um, other lessons do you take from your dad? Lessons so consistency um compound and consistency i mean you can't just show up and expect it to be good i mean it takes a lot of work what did he do or does so he do? just just things so so he was a mail carrier um for the u.s post office he's retired hmm. now um very excellent sports um and just just very organized and systematic so just things like basketball you know, a lot of times when individuals join a basketball team, the only time they're going to practice is when the coaches tell them to. Whereas we would practice every day, hmm. you know, every day, Saturday, Sunday, maybe not a long amount of time, but it just took the work um, to get to those higher levels. Um, I want to talk a little about the mentors you've had, coaches, just in general, who, who is it maybe – even a distant mentor, who are some of your favorite coaches of all time? Coaches of all time. So Cliff Davis, my junior high basketball mm -hmm. coach, hmm. just very process oriented. So his practices were structured very well. He was definitely a leader and he took that consistent approach. Um, you know, and it was very rewarding. We were actually, we had some great teams because of how he, he led Mm -hmm. Um, he's one that definitely stands out. I had a great high school basketball coach that had a very good physical fitness type of, um, uh, off, you know, good off regiment. season program. Yeah. I'm like in arm's reach. Like one of my favorite books of all time. If, if anyone's watching the oh, video yeah. is wooden, um, a lifetime of observations of reflection on and off the court. I mean, this is, this is one of my favorite. You could see those like notes coming out of it. Like read this at least once a year. Practice the fundamentals. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
what about mentors or coaches in business? I know that you take, you know, you take this very seriously and you have mentors in that too. So my uncle <clears throat> was a CEO of multiple major corporations. And he was one that I always like looked up to and aspired term, you know, originally when I got started, I talked to him, but I would say my first mentor was actually my sister. Uh, my sister and my brother-in-law, they run a 30 to 40 person plumbing company generating seven to $8 million a year. Um, can't quite see it, but up here, I was a Vistage member for three years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have, uh, I'm in Jason Swink's mastermind. So I, I have like-minded peers, digital mm -hmm. marketing peers. Mm -hmm. I also have an executive coach, Carl Sakis. Who's amazing that holds me accountable because once you're the owner, you're the, you're the main person that holds you accountable. So I have someone else now. And then this counts another sounds kind of cliche or cheesy, but I, I really enjoy getting a lot of knowledge from business books. And I know you read a ton yourself and you know, I read 50, 60 yeah. minimum books a year uh, about business only, not, you know, not fiction, just, just all business yeah. books. What are some of your favorites? I'm, uh, I, have, I need, to, I have four credits for my audible queue. So yeah, what, uh, yeah. what are your favorites? Um, one I find myself reading multiple times is ready, fire, aim. Mm, Michael Masterson. Yeah. Yeah. I love that book. I love, uh, I just want to read one recently. Uh, Atomic habits was excellent. Mm. I, uh, the ultimate sales machine. I know it's an older book, uh, Chet Holmes. And oh yeah, totally. Great one. Pricing creativity, Blair Inns, business of expertise. I printed Baker. out the ultimate sales machine. I bought it TDF and I printed it out and put it in a binder. Yeah. So every time I read it, I find one, uh, just a little nugget. That's that it's just excellent. And <clears throat> You know, David C. Baker and Blair Ants. I really like their stuff. Um, what, is, what is their book? I don't, I've not heard them. So Blair Ants did Pricing Creativity. Mm -hmm. He also did When Without Pitching Manifesto. And then David's main book was The Business of Expertise, which really talks a lot about the advantages of niching. Okay, nice. What about industry-wise? Um, conferences in the industry, um, could be in the, you know, personal injury law firm or, or whatever, you know, just stay on top of the, the trade. So the one that I've been to the last two years is the Game Changer Summit. That mm -hmm. is Michael Mogul's conference, uh, Chris Video. It's an excellent conference. They do a lot of team building, but they also do a marketing, uh, have a lot of great speakers, Chris Voss, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of the big players. They had Gary V there. In terms of personal injury attorneys, I, the other conferences that I hear are good but I, I don't go to a lot of conferences are uh, mass torts made perfect and national trial lawyers association. Mm. Both a good event. That's a must for personal injury law firms. Yeah. Mass state torts made perfect is, is one that's really incredible in Vegas uh, that I hear a lot of good things about too. Nice. Now from the, you know, the auditing standpoint, I, I like, you know, you have a very, um, systematic approach. It's like, okay, you have this law firm. Here's what we charge. You don't necessarily do that. You actually have this process where you walk through and so you give them a real specific kind of detailed approach. Talk a little bit about what you do there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of mirroring an attorney, right? An attorney doesn't go to trial without doing a discovery, and getting all the information about the, the case. Like, a lot of times these SEO agencies will just one call close and sell you on a two or $3,000 contract without knowing anything about what it's going to take to get results. So we do what I call a full SEO discovery where we are going to diagnose yeah. everything uh, in regards to SEO. So it's not just an SEO audit where you're auditing a website. We do competitive backlink analysis. We review content. We review their assets uh, for social proof and, and we look at their top ranked competitors and what they're doing well and what, what, you know, any opportunity that we can use as leverage, we try to discover um, in this diagnosis. Yeah, that's super valuable for a company for you to go through that. How do you decide to, to charge for that? 
So that's the tricky part with SEO, right? You know, PPC and these others are very, it's very data driven. You can spend X, get this amount of cases. Yeah. The way I mean, I just it, mean even the front end one, like actually you presenting that to them. Yeah, I mean, we charge $5,000 for this diagnosis, this SEO discovery, and yeah. I can tell you that that we're not making any money. We're losing money on this initial. Yeah, it's a lot so of if work. if the client didn't proceed further, it would be, you know, it's a loss leader by all definitions. Yeah. But to me, it's important that we understand the ins and outs of what this client has you know and it lets us set realistic expectations you know if you're in a major metro and you're you hope you're a solo in los angeles and you want to rank on the first page for car accident lawyer it's going to take a heavy investment because you have no brand you have no prominence that can help you know no mentions that we can use as leverage but if you're an established brand established firm maybe you have some assets that we can use to get you there quicker do you find that lawyers or law firms or some are sophisticated enough to use some of those tools, not necessarily to execute on what you do, but just to see what's going on? Or do they, do they not even realize there's some of these tools out there? Oh, yeah. So the larger firms, a lot of times what we've encountered is the owners are more that, you know, in the DISC personality assessment, they would be more the DI drivers. A lot of times they hire that an internal process analytical person to strategically communicate with the vendors that they hire. Um, and many times those individuals, those directors of marketing, those CMOs, those uh, the, all different types of titles, technology directors, those individuals are familiar with those tools. You know, Chris, as you get more and more specific and niche, you can produce better results, which means you could charge more. Um, Tell me about the pricing evolution you've gone through, you know, in the very beginning to, to now, um, obviously it's probably changed a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there are three basic models that you'll see. So the, the first one will be your in, inputs. So a, an agency will charge you per hour. You'll have a per hour rate. So it's like a capacity type setup. The second would be output. So it would be like units, like X amount of content, X amount of articles. And then the, the last is more results or value. Okay, so you wanna get that first page result. What are you willing to pay? What's it worth? And then that, with that model, it's a little bit harder to sell. You have to do these diagnoses. You have to unveil your expertise, but it allows the agency owner to iterate and do whatever's possible to get results because you're not tied into a unit thing that you need to change in the future, keep right. these change orders. So we do more result or value-based pricing. And so you won't see an itemized, we're gonna do X amount of content, X amount of links. We're gonna do whatever it takes and we expect the client to fire us if we don't. So there's that expectation of, we have to generate results or you're going to leave. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not, we're going to put you on this low retainer and keep you forever. On that, um, let's just say in a personal injury law firm, I don't know what an average client case is or something, but let's just make it up and, you know, mm -hmm. let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars or something. Let's say the first month they work with you, first few months, they get like 30 cases. Okay. And it's like, great. We just pay for these people for a long time, right? Um, do you find that, is it a, you know, what have you done for me lately type of scenario? So like in month eight, they're like, okay, you haven't got anything, but like, wait, a couple months ago, we got you like 30 cases or do they, do they tend to remember that and like give you a little slack as far as building that up? I'd say that accounts department, that person that's in charge of communication, that's a really important component because it's natural for individuals to, to forget when they had a big win. So they need that reminding. They need to, we do a baseline report, every engagement. Here's your rankings and traffic when you started. And then we remind them like, here's the percentage growth in six months. Like, look at the increase. Like, that's where we started. Here's where we're at now. So those retrospectives and yeah, it, it goes in. So you bring up something else that's kind of interesting is 
the value of a case is different. So it depends on if they're going to try try the case and go to the court and litigate. You know, those that and most of the time those are serious injuries and can be. You know, those are the ones you want to litigate. And those case values are extremely high versus. I don't want to say settlement bill, but where you're settling with the insurance companies before going to court, those cases typically are a lot less. Um, and it, there's a whole different situation for staffing. There's advantages and disadvantages when it comes to SEO. You know, for example, one of the big driving factors for local SEO is reviews. Well, if your case selection is so tight where you only work with these major injuries, the amount of cases you're closing it's low, so you have less chance to get reviews versus someone that's taking the minor injuries and really settling a lot of cases. They can get a lot of local reviews to help their SEO. Mm. What are, you know, speaking on that for a second, I do want you to tell there's a story about your biggest client a couple years in. I'll be tell that in a second. But um, for any local business, you know, like plumbing company, your sister mm -hmm. and brother in law, right? I always knew plumbing. There was, I mean, like if your toilet doesn't work, you'll pay whatever amount of money. To, to a plumber to fix that thing, you know? Right. So, but um, what are some, uh, you know, tips that other local businesses could be using that you use obviously for in the most competitive, one of the most competitive niches? I mean, I, I would highly recommend anyone looking for an SEO agency to do some form of diagnosis or audit before any engagement is pursued. You know, it's, it's essential to have the strategy first, you know, Pareto, Pareto's principle, you know, the 80, 80, 20, you know, strategy is one of the most important components. And that's what I would say. It wouldn't matter if it was plumbing, home services, physicians, it would be to do a full discovery and analysis first. Mm -hmm. And any particular tools she, people should look at that you like? So, my favorite SEO tool is ahrefs.com. I also like SimRush. I think those have, uh, they're pretty versatile. They do a lot of things. I think ahrefs is a little bit more intuitive, a little bit easier to use. And, but both of those tools are phenomenal. They can give you a lot of competitor insights to help you make decisions uh, with your SEO strategy. Um, biggest client a couple years in. What happened? Oh, so, <laughs> that's funny. So I remember I was working from home, but you know, my, my biggest client, it was like the, the end of year one and you gotta, you gotta, you know, I know I hear a lot of stories where people sign hundred dollar and $500 clients or, or they traded coffee <laughs> subscriptions and things. My, my biggest was 3,500 a month. And I remember that he wanted to meet in person before he did it. So he, he said, hey, let's meet at a halfway point. We'll just, you know, hit up a restaurant. Well, the town that he picked, there was literally nothing. There was a gas station and it was had one of those gas stations connected to like a Hardee's. So I went in and it, there was like stuff all over the floor. And I'm just like, what am I going to do? And instead of meeting in there, he actually got in my SUV in my car with me and we signed the deal in in the parking lot in my car. He just wanted to be, have that last reassure, reassuring moment. And that's what happened. I mean, so he I- He wanted to be a real human being. He just wanted to- Absolutely, yeah. What um, about now? What does that look like now? Because obviously you, probably, you have clients all over the country. Is it, less, some, is it less frequent that people don't care about that as much because of like technology of just going video chat or do you, do you find people still want that you to show up in person at some point? It's very rare that they want to me to show up in person. In fact, I can't recall a situation in the last two years that was the case, but I think our reputation and clout and uh, has grown to where it's not some unknown person doing the marketing, they already actually know me from some, from some aspect. And, you know, most of our leads are referrals. So it has that extra, you know, point of trust because of the person referring to us. Yeah. It seems important for you to have the team in place, the system in place. Um, what's important to you as far as hiring and culture? How do you maintain a culture and, and hire properly? 
That's a good question. So one of the advantages of owning a remote company is when we want to hire talent, we can open it up to the entire United States. So there's a lot more applicants. So we have a very tedious hiring process. We'll start with an initial uh, posting, whether it's on Indeed or other sites, to get the resumes um, for the applicants. I, I, I just like saying resume because I haven't looked at a resume in two years. Um, we then do a, an initial proof of knowledge, whether it's a quiz or some type of, of test or assessment. We then use Spark Hire, which is a video mm -hmm. platform. It's based in Chicago, it. actually, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. So I remember when I started, I would interview someone, but I couldn't, even if I took great notes, I couldn't remember you know, the individual because we would go through a lot of interviews. And so Spark Hire, doing that initial recording, I could, it, it could be used as a reminder and then also that's a future recruiting tool. You know, if, if a person wasn't a right fit for what I was hiring currently, they may be one for a different position in the future. So we spark hire and then we do, then after that, we do a, uh, you know, a higher end on the phone type of interview. But there's a lot of steps to it. They, you know, it, it's like call, crawling through glass, so to speak. It's not just, you know, looking at the resume and having some conversations. There's more to it. Yeah. Oh yeah. You, what are some ways you weed people out? And I was talking yeah. to someone the other day and they'll put something in the description, like include a PDF attachment of your resume and they don't do that. And, and this person was saying, you know, 70% of people don't even do that step. So I don't know if you have any of those weed out tricks. Our biggest one for SEO specialists is a quiz. Only three to 4% pass the quiz. How many? Three to four percent. Wow. It's timed and it is difficult. So that weeds out a, a ton. You know, other positions will do a, you know, attach a cover letter, specifically say attach a cover letter in multiple locations. And they don't, we just fast fail them, even though they may be great, but we fast fail them. Yeah. That quiz is the number one thing that we use. Yeah. What about um, you know, daily routine or weekly routine? What's important to you? And I, cause I, I bring that up because you are doing this crazy challenge right now, which I'll have you talk about. Yeah. So, you know, I got this from atomic habits, the book I mentioned, it's, you know, if you want to achieve a goal, it's best to change your process, your, your daily habits in order to hit that goal and really reward yourself for the journey. And so it's just these minor changes. You know, one of the biggest ones for me is, is self-improvement, self-learning. So I have a morning routine where, you know, after I get my cup of coffee, I am listening to an audio book or reading. And I have a certain amount of time set there. And then on my commute to work, which it's not very far, and, I, and I, we're a remote company, but I do have a headquarters, uh, small headquarters, but... So I'll listen to the audiobook on the way to work and, and the way home. So I'm fitting in time to, to continually improve and, and learn. So what are you doing with this challenge? Do you want, I don't know if you want to pull oh, yeah, it. If it's, yeah. so, if it's handy for the video, do you have it handy? That, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I might. So, um, okay. So what is this exactly? This is <laughs> Seth Godin. It's a flag. So basically, you know, Seth's famous for his consistency. He's been, he's been writing a daily blog and hasn't missed for like years. So he writes 365 blogs a year. And I like to set these like extreme challenges, these 10x Grant Cardone style challenges to really push myself. And so I'm doing 365 blogs in, a, in February in a month. Mm. So there's a lot of process changes, uh, mm -hmm. tactical things that go into that in order to have the ability to even fulfill that. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of like a personal challenge I'm doing. Does this count as one of them? No. No, oh, it does not. Even though, so even yeah, it doesn't count. You mentioned reward. I find that a lot of hard charging entrepreneurs I know are really bad with rewarding themselves. They just kind of push the goalposts further. 
Oh, we yep. hit that. Oh, awesome. But we could be doing this. So how, what do you do to reward yourself? I'm not the best at that. I will say this. Um, my, my coach, I mentioned earlier, Carl Sakis, we have a reward and consequence. And the reward I set every, uh, every month. So sometimes it's a massage and it forces me to schedule that massage or mm. to get a new pair of shoes. Um, in the office, I really wanted a cool piece of art. So after we hit a certain size retainer, uh, we bought a big piece of art up front. Um, but then there's the consequence. So it's the thing, it's the painful things that I don't want to do. Or um, one of mine, I'm not going to say because there's, there's things you don't talk about, political, whatever. But one Consequence of my, meaning, Chris, like if you don't hit the goal? I or, don't hit the goal. Or if you don't give yourself a reward. <laughs> No, if I don't hit the goal. Got it. Okay. So I've had one where I send cash to a, an X party, political party, because I don't want to do that. There's, yeah, there's apps for that, right? Like you can, you can actually go on and they have those things that whatever, like a white supremacist like site or something like that. If you don't yeah. hit the goal or I forgot what I'm it is. not that a, extreme. No, but. but there's, there's a bunch of ones that people make a bet, but it forces you, it, it creates enough pain that you, you know, you're, you're going to like, okay, there's an extra pain driver there. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of my, I've always done really well with business goals, but like, um, health and exercise I'm struggling at. So sometimes hmm. my rewards, my consequence, which healthy people wouldn't think it's a consequence would be like, okay, I have to sign up for a 5k. <laughs> I do not want to run this 5k. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that might be. Consequence. So is it a, I hope it's not a health goal that the punishment is actually getting healthier. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay. sometimes it's stuff like that. I mean, I try to get a, I'm trying to improve my healthy habits. Um, but there's some things like it may even be, you know, I had a, personal trainer and, you know, work out three or four times a week, but there are certain exercises that are good for you. That I just don't want to do like deadlifts. Right. right. So it'd be like, okay, it's, it's, it's a negative, it's a consequence, but it's still good for me. Yeah. Yeah. There's a funny comedian bit about two people. I won't go into it about one, you know, was exercising. Why don't you just run? You get this runner's high. And the guy was like, no, um, I've done drugs. It's nowhere near what, you know, what a high actually is <laughs> for which talk show it was. I don't know if it was Howard Stern or someone, but um, Chris, that's, that's super valuable too, because, you know, we're, you're not only rewarding, but it, you, we, sometimes we're driven more by pain than pleasure. Right. Yep. So putting that in place, um, you mentioned referrals, referrals are big for you. What are some good ways for people to think about referrals and to, you know, give to their, their current customers or advocates? It's a great question. So our, our number one source of lead gen is referrals and it's not client referrals. It's non-client referrals. What I mean by that is one of the huge, the best advantages of niching down into a narrow focus is we have to say no to a lot of other individuals that, that come to us. So if a bankruptcy attorney comes to us, we don't do that. We only work with personal injury lawyers. So we can refer out to strategic partners and it sets up uh, Seal Donnie's reciprocity. You know, um, we send so many leads, people want to continue to get those. So when a personal injury attorney comes to them, they may send that to us. Yeah. I always tell people the best way to get referrals is to give a referral. Yes. It's very simple. It's the best. Yep. Yeah. You know, Chris, first I want to say thank you. Um, I have two last questions. Everyone should ch check out rankings.il, but I always ask since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a challenging moment, low moment, and what's mm -hmm. been a proud moment on the other end? Good question. Uh, Challenging moment would, would be probably, I think, th over three years ago, over hiring. Hmm. I think every business owner experiences that and weren't tracking our, weren't using leading lagging indicators well enough and over hired, didn't forecast properly. So that kind of hurt our cash flow and, and um, that was a, a learning experience for sure. How do you the, navigate that? 
you know, we're ELS and traction uh, really helped. Profit first, Mike McCallowitz really helped. Um, so we are looking at the numbers on a weekly basis as, le as leading indicators. So things like accounts receivable, money out on the street, so to speak. We know who, who owes us money and we're not letting it go too long. Um, you know, we have an AR 30 plus, so accounts receivable 30 plus out on the street that we know that we need to keep hitting them to get the money or we shut down the service. Um, hard lessons learned like that, you know, great people, but they don't pay you, you know, can't do money for free. So those, those, those are some difficult ones. Um, some exciting ones, I, I would say, you know, Inc. Inc. 5000 back to back last two years. Um, those are probably some really, some really good accomplishments. Um, for our clients, we've got, you know, I like, I think the rewards are our clients. You know, we've got a client ranking number one nationwide uh, for car accident lawyer. We got uh, number one in Chicago, Philadelphia, and Houston for car accident lawyer, you know, major metros. So those are some really exciting uh, wins too. What about, um, you know, like you mentioned, is re rewarding when you get your clients um, results? Do you remember a specific um, company or case when they were extremely appreciative above and beyond? Was there, was there anything like that that was especially rewarding? Oh, yeah. So I, we, we've been flown out to... Um, clear water been put up in the nicest resort we had um we've got some tremendous gifts and yeah so i, I would say flying out to location flying they, they sent us on trips and things like that have been really cool yeah um people should check out rankings.io anywhere else we should point people towards online rankings.io is the main but if you guys want to connect <laughs> I accept all connection requests. Say that one more time. It, it faded out for a second. Chris Dreyer at LinkedIn. Yeah, Chris Dreyer at LinkedIn. I accept all connection requests. Cool. I expect nothing less from you to be focused on rankings.io. We should not send anyone else to anywhere else except for rankings.io. Chris, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Really appreciate it. Jeremy, thank you so much for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.